Today's program is called Staying the Course, Overcoming Adversity. Dick Beardsley became world famous as a second place finisher in the 1982 Boston Marathon, a memorable contest known as The Duel in the Sun. His book, Staying the Course, recounts that race and the challenges that followed, including a series of near fatal accidents and a subsequent addiction to painkillers. As a motivational and inspirational speaker, Beardsley now shares his experiences of overcoming these and other tragedies with audiences worldwide. Please welcome our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first off, I'd like to say hi to my good friend, Bob Bartling. Bob's a young 96 years old. Can you believe that? Yeah, he's, Bob, Bob was a huge influence to me. I came to South Dakota State in 1978. In fact, the last time I think I was in this library was 44 years ago. And uh, I came here and just ran for one semester at South Dakota State back in 1978. But I have lifelong friends from that one semester I was here, including my dearest friend in the world, uh, Mike Dunlap, who Bob is, uh, no, Bob knows Mike real well. Mike grew up on a farm near Lenox and was a state high school champion here in South Dakota in cross country. So it's, uh, it's great to be here back in, uh, at SDSU. And boy, the campus has grown, holy cow, since I was here, you know, way back when. But um, 20 years ago now, I, I wrote a book called Staying the Course. Well, I shouldn't say I wrote it myself. I had a young, a, a gal help me with it because let's just say this, I flunked uh, seventh grade English. So um, <laughs> I'm not the real best at uh, that type of thing. But I wrote a book called Staying the Course and uh, 20 years ago it came out and we, it still sells today. A lot has happened uh, since that book came out and you'll hear some of that today. And we're, we're actually working on uh, uh, kind of a re, re edition of the book Stay in the Course to add some things that have gone on since it first came out 20 years ago. So, before I go any further, though, I'd like to share a little video with you.
<laughs> what did I just do? <laughs> Oops, I don't want to go back here. We'll go back. <laughs> I'm not very techy. There we go. Let me, I, I better use this microphone. Does that come off of here? Kind of give it, there we go, there. Can you, is that better? Okay. Um, oh my gosh. <clears throat> 1.6 seconds. That's what the, the difference was. You know, I can't remember what I had for lunch this afternoon, but I can remember that race 40 years ago this past April. Like it, uh, like I ran it this morning. In fact, all that, all the things you'll see here this afternoon are, are in my book, Stay in the Course. Uh, they go into a little more detail in the, in the book, obviously, than I can, can speak about it. But um, that race is something that um, still resonates in my mind almost on a continual basis, and especially this year, whether it being the, the 40th anniversary of that race. But as a kid growing up, you know, people think they, that I was this kid that came out of my mother's womb with a pair of running shoes on, and I was a Minnesota state champion in cross country and, and track and went on to a major university on a full ride scholarship onto the Olympics and so on and so forth. But my whole world, is this on? Yeah. Yeah, okay, my whole world really growing up revolved around the outdoors. Hunting and fishing, I started my own fishing guide business, which I still do to this day when I was 12 years old. That was my little, uh, that was me in the middle there with a little longer locks that I had now. <clears throat> Trapping and milking cows. The thought of doing anything athletically never even crossed my mind until I started my junior year of high school. And I'll never forget that day in se early September of 1973 when I walked through my high school doors and for the first time in my life, girls started looking a lot better to me than like a dead raccoon laying alongside the road. But I was the most shy, bashful kid, and the thought of saying hi to a girl, let alone actually speaking to one, or heaven forbid actually asking one out on a date, literally made me sick to my stomach. But I noticed that a lot of my buddies that were good in sports, they always were wearing their high school letter jackets around school. They had girls hanging all over them. So I'm thinking, that's it. All I got to do is earn myself a letter jacket and the chicks will come to me. <laughs> so right then and there on the spot, I decided I'm going out for the football team. Well, look at me. I'm six foot tall, weigh 135 pounds, but I was determined I was going to be a football player. And I remember running into the boys locker room that afternoon after school got out and my fire teacher was a head football coach and I was so gosh dang excited. I go, Coach Schaefer, I'm coming out for the football team. He didn't say a word. He just started laughing at me. He goes, Beards, they will crush you like a pop can out there. He goes, my gosh, you turned sideways, we can't even see you. For about 10 minutes, he tried to talk me out of it, but I would not listen. And I'll never forget that afternoon when I ran out onto that football field with about 15 other guys, and we're at the 50 yard line, and we've got this big circle around Coach Schaefer. He's in the middle holding a football, explaining what we're gonna do for practice that day, when all of a sudden he takes that football and he throws it towards the end zone, and he hollers, Beardsley, fumble, get the ball. So I take off sprinting, as fast as these skinny little legs would take me, and I jumped on that football, and moments later, way more guys than that hog piled on top of me. When I fought my way out of that mass of humanity, when I got up out of that pile of guys, my helmet was on crooked, my shoulder pads were sticking out, my football pants were down to my ankles, and at that point I'm thinking, there is not a girl alive that is worth going through this. And I quit. I actually walked off the field. My entire football career from start to finish lasted 43 and a half minutes. That was it. So here I was a kid, 17 years old. I'd never had a date with a girl at the time. Couldn't even talk to one. And now I don't last an hour on the football team. What little self-esteem I had pretty much went right down the drain. But sometimes what we perceive as terrible disappointments in our lives turn out to be incredible blessings. And that's what it was for me. Because a couple of days later, a friend of mine says, Beards, 
I heard you flopped on the football team. He said, you ever thought about going out for the cross country team? I'd never heard of a cross country team. I said, tell me about this cross country. And he told me we ran up and down the hills, through the woods, jumping over logs and creeks. And I thought, golly, that sounds like it might be kind of fun. But my second more important question to him was, do they tackle you in cross country running? <laughs> and when he said no, I decided I'm going out for the team. So that following Monday, I showed up for my very first day of practice. I had no idea they made things called running shoes. I had on a pair of like a Converse basketball shoes or something. And our coach says, all right, boys, line up here out in front of the school on the road there. We're going to do the around the block run. Now, I'd never run before, but I knew this. I knew I was stubborn enough and I was determined enough that I could surely run around the block and stay with my teammates. So our coach lines us up. He steps up onto the curb. He takes his cigarette out of his mouth. <laughs> they got anybody they could to coach cross country back then. And he blows his whistle and off we go. We get down to the end of the first street corner. We turn left. I'm right with all my teammates. We get up to the next street corner. We turn left there. I'm still right there with all my teammates. And now I'm thinking, okay, we get to the next street corner. We turn left. Back to the high school. Practice is over. Man, this cross country is going to be fun. So we're coming up onto that next street corner. And I start leaning to the left but they kept going straight. I'm thinking, I guess they're feeling pretty good this morning. They're gonna run two blocks. Well, we get up to that next street corner and I don't just lean left, I actually turn left, but they kept going straight. At that point, honestly, it felt like somebody had their hand on my throat trying to rip my heart right out. It felt like my lungs were about ready to explode. And pretty soon, we were out of streets in town and out into the countryside and it wasn't long after that, that they were so far in front of me, I could no longer see them. Thankfully, one of them, one of my teammates came back to where I was struggling to put one foot in front of the other. And he says to me, Beards, follow the road you're on all the way to the end. When you get to the end of that road, turn left. When you get to the next road, turn left there, and it'll take you back to the high school. And off he went. Well, I came to find out that what they called their around-the-block run was actually 3.2 miles long. Now, that doesn't seem very far to me today, but back then, it seemed like forever. I had to walk the last mile. I could not run it. By the time I got back to my high school parking lot, all my teammates and my coach had already showered and gone home. But when I crossed that imaginary finish line, I was so excited. I remember thinking to myself, gosh, Dick, I don't know how far you just ran and walked, but you made it. And I'll just bet you, Dick, if you work real, real hard, if you do what your coach tells you to do, if you believe in yourself, surely you can get good enough to make the varsity squad, to earn the letter jacket, to get the date with a girl. That was my whole inspiration for running at that point, was to get a date with a girl. And I did everything my coach told me to do. I showed up on time for practice. I never complained about a workout, even ran on the weekends when I didn't have to. But I was terrible. Thankfully, we had a JV team, or I wouldn't have been able to run in any meets at all. But of course, being on the JV team, you don't earn a letter jacket. And as soon as the season ended that fall, I didn't run another step. And the following spring, my coach says, so Beards, you're coming out for the track team, aren't you? I go, the track team? You mean that dirt road that goes around the football field? We had a cinder track back then. He goes, yeah. I go, no. I go, that's fishing season. But I'd already had a goal set for myself. And the day cross country ended the fall before, I'd set a goal for myself that once summer vacation started, my goal was to run every single day that summer. And that summer, I ran every single day. Now, I didn't run real far, didn't run real fast, but I ran every single day. And I came back for my senior year of high school, my second year of cross country. And it was one year to the day we did that same exact around the block run. 
But this time, instead of all my teammates finishing in front of me, they all finished behind me. Now that's not saying a whole lot because we didn't have a very good team, but it showed me that if you are determined and committed to something, don't let anybody, especially yourself, keep you from going after those dreams. Now saying all that stuff, I never did qualify in Minnesota for a state meet in cross country or for track. I did run track my senior year, but I'd fallen in love with this incredible sport of distance running. Now, a lot of people, when they look at my running resume or they see that Boston video, they think, man, Minnesota kid probably got a full ride scholarship, ran at the University of Minnesota for those golden gophers. Well, first off, there was no scholarship. I did, however, run at the University of Minnesota, just not the one you're probably thinking of. I ran at the University of Minnesota slash Wasika, a very small two-year agricultural college in Wasika, Minnesota, which is now a federal prison, so it kind of tells you about where I got my degree from. But I had a coach there, Dr. John Fulkrod, who I still am in contact to this day and keep in touch with him. He's in his 80s now. But one day after practice, he put his arm around my shoulder and he says, you know, Dick, I really believe you can become as good of a runner as you want to be. And I never, ever forgot that. And then because of the little bit of success I had at the University of Minnesota Wasika, Coach Scott Underwood, who was the cross country coach here at SDSU back then, gave me a partial scholarship to come out here. Now, I wasn't the greatest student in the world, never was. My sisters got straight A's and I, I was happy when I got C's. But I came out here mainly just to run. And even though I was only out here one semester, the fall semester of 1978, our cross country team then were runner up in the national championship division two out in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. But I made lifelong friends with people here in Brookings, including Bob Bartling. When I didn't have a nickel in my pocket and couldn't afford a pair of shoes, Bob, of course, for years had a running store in the basement of his furniture shop. And um, Bob kind of took me under his wing. And for that, I'll ever be forever grateful, Bob. Thank you for that. And my best friend in the world, Mike Dunlap, who I met the very first day of cross country practice 44 years ago. Mike and I have, have been inseparable since. We've been best friends. I've seen every one of their kids uh, born, had them in my arms the first couple of days. So there's a lot of history for me here, even though I was only here for one semester. In fact, there was so much history that after that 1982 Boston Marathon, even though I lived in South Dakota just for not very long when I was going to school here, after that marathon, I think 1982 or 83, they made me this the South Dakota Sportsman of the Year or something. I <laughs> guess they needed somebody that year, and I did have a few roots there, I guess. So, but, um, but never in my wildest dreams did I ever think my running would take me to where it did. I was very fortunate. So that's me on the left. Sorry about the headshots there. I was very fortunate to, to win the very first London Marathon, now one of the most biggest marathons in the world, in 1981 but I didn't win it alone. The guy on my right is Inga Simonsen from Norway. We tied, they both gave us first place. And Inga and I have gone on to become really, really good friends. And we have some ties there because my grandma came to Minnesota from Norway. So that's pretty cool. And, and then in 1981, that same year, a couple of three months later, I one very fortunate to win my very, very first grandma's marathon and was fortunate to set a course record there. I ran two hours, nine minutes and 36 seconds. And that record stood for 33 years until a Kenyan broke it in 2014, I think it was. But never in my wildest dreams, when I graduated from high school in May of 1975, did I ever think that a short seven years later, I'd be in that little town of Hopkinton, Massachusetts getting ready for the greatest foot race in the world, the Jack 15, no, the, the Boston Marathon. <laughs> you know, I can, like I said earlier, I can still remember that day like it happened this morning. 
And now back then, the Boston Marathon, by tradition, started at 12 noon. That's how they did things back then. At the starting line, it was 75 degrees and not a cloud in the sky. And I'm standing on that very front row, and the starter puts up his pistol and he hollers, one minute! And I look to my right, and two guys down from me is that guy wearing number two, Alberto Salazar. I look to my left, there's a guy named Bill Rogers. Bill Rogers had won the Boston Marathon four times. I'm looking up and down this front row, and I'm seeing Olympians and world-class athletes from around the world, and I'm thinking, what in the heck am I doing on the same starting line with these guys? But as soon as that silly thought crossed my mind, I thought, no, did you gotta, you've worked hard at this. You, did, you deserve to be here as much as anybody else. And with that, the gun went off, and Selazar shot out of there like he was shot from a rocket, and I was right along his side. We went through the first mile of that 26.2 mile race in four minutes and 33 seconds. And I'm hanging on for dear life. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, hanging on and you still got 25.2 miles to go is not a good feeling. But I just kept telling myself, okay, Dick, just calm down. You've done the work, you'll be fine. I hit mile two, I felt worse. Again, I'm talking to myself, Dick, just hang in there. When I hit mile three, I felt so bad that the first thought to cross my mind, and I'm one of the most positive people you will ever meet, was to drop out. How different my life would be today if I had taken that easy way out, made up some cockamamie excuse. I probably wouldn't be here today. It's those moments that every one of us face in our lives, some of us more than others, where we don't think we can take another step, yet somehow we do. And you take in another and another and another. I hit mile four and I felt no better, but I didn't feel any worse. And at that point, that was a huge confidence builder for me. <laughs> Finally, I got into my groove. That day, there was an estimated one and a half million spectators lining the streets. And there was no fencing up to keep the crowds back. And that lead group I was in, as it got smaller and smaller and smaller until we got to the 17-mile point, and there were two guys left in the lead, Selazar, the world record holder, and as the Boston Globe newspaper had dubbed me the day before, Dick Beardsley, the country bumpkin from Minnesota. <laughs> and nobody gave me a chance, or anybody else, against Selazar. Well, from 17 to 21 miles, there's a set of four hills, and my coach, Bill Squires at the time, told me, run those hills as hard as you can on the up and even harder on the downside. And that's what I did on every hill, trying to shake Selazar. I finally get to the very top of Heartbreak Hill. It's almost a mile long. And I look behind me, I glance over my shoulder and he's in my back pocket. We come down the back side of Heartbreak Hill and I'm literally doing the 100 meter sprint, trying to break away from Selazar. I get down to the bottom where it flattened out. I didn't even have to look behind me to see if he was still there. He was so close I could hear him breathing. And at that point I could no longer feel my legs. And the thought of running five more miles at the pace we were running, literally was making me sick to my stomach. But I knew this. I knew no matter how bad I was hurting, I knew I could run one more mile. And the good Lord has all given us this incredible gift between the ears called a brain. And my brain, in a split second, convinced my body that you don't have to run five more miles. All you gotta do is run one more. Now all of a sudden, the task at hand didn't seem so daunting. Next thing I know, I see the 22nd mile mark. I say, okay, Dick, you still got that little bit of a lead. One more mile. Bam, I see the 23rd mile mark. Okay, Dick, just one more mile. Bang, there's the 24th mile mark. I still got that little bit of a lead. And then as long as I live, I will never, ever forget what I saw next. In front of me on that street, in blue and gold paint, it said 25.2 miles. And right below that, it said one mile to go. 
At that point, I got so weak kneed and rubber legged, I honestly did not know if I'd be able to take another step. At that point, for some reason, tears just started streaming down my cheeks. At that point, for some reason, I flashed back to that day in May of 1975 when I walked off my high school stage, the first one in my family to get a high school diploma. And I walked out to where my mom and dad were sitting and my dad, who had an eighth grade education, was crying. I handed my dad my diploma. He handed me back a small little envelope and he said to me, D, here, this is your graduation gift from your mom and I. So I opened it up. I pulled out this small piece of paper and in my dad's eighth grade handwriting, it said, D, this is good for round trip airfare to the Boston Marathon. Maybe someday you'll want to run it. Love, mom and dad. Here I was not only running it, but I was winning it. And I knew my folks were back home in Minnesota watching it on television. I'm thinking, Dick, you have got to get your mind off your mom and dad. Think about something else, anything. <laughs> I finally thought back to a terrible blind date I once went on in high school. I knew that was gonna come in handy, and it did. And I got my mind off my mom and dad, back into the race, and with about 900 meters to go, two loops of a track and a little longer, I had the biggest lead I'd had all day long, an arm length and a half. <laughs> and I knew Salazar didn't have a great finishing kick, but I knew he had a lot better one than I had. And I thought, Richard, you've got to go now like you've never pushed before. And as I pushed off with my right leg to give one last hard surge to try to break open that gap, I got the biggest Charlie horse in my right hamstring. It literally sent me up in the air. Selazar went flying by me like I was running backwards. Five meters he had on me, 10 meters, 50 meters. At one point, he had almost a 100 meter lead. But I learned more about myself in those last two and a half minutes of that race that has enabled me to get through way, way more difficult things in my life than that 1982 Boston Marathon. And what I learned on those streets in Boston over 40 years ago now is that no matter how high that so-called mountain is to climb, no matter the difficulties you're going through, as long as you keep moving forward, even if it's in little bitty baby steps, there's always that hope. It's about believing in yourself. It's about that commitment and determination. It's about having faith. It's about being in the right place at the right time. And as Salazar continued to get further down the street, I'm running along the right-hand side the best I can, trying to rub out that hamstring cramp. And the crowd moved back to let me come by. And when they did, I was in the right place at the right time. My right foot came down into a pothole I didn't see. I hit that pothole and almost fell to the ground. But when I almost fell to the ground, it jerked my right leg and it popped the knot right out. Now I had my stride back. Well, as you can see on the end of that video, I finally caught back up to Alberto with a little over 100 meters to go. And basically after running over 26 miles, it now came down to a 100 meter sprint. And that day, Alberto won it, ran two hours, eight minutes, and 51 seconds. And I was right behind him in two hours, eight minutes, and 52.6 seconds. I remember crossing that finish line. Half of me had never been so excited about anything in my entire life. And the other half of me had never been so disappointed. I'm thinking, I just ran a 208 marathon, but I got second. <laughs> But at the end of the day, no matter what it is, running a race, doing your job at work, dealing with family situations, if at the end of the day you know you gave it your very, very best, how can you be disappointed in that? And you can't be. And I'm gonna kind of fast forward it here a little bit because I know I, I don't have a, as much time as I usually do when I'm doing a regular talk. But that race opened doors for me like never before. Sports Illustrated, a couple of months later said, not only will Dick Beardsley make the Olympic team in 1984 in LA, many of them picked me to win a medal. 
But unfortunately, I blew up my Achilles tendon about nine months before the Olympic trials marathon. The Olympic orthopedic surgeon for the U.S. rebuilt it. He said, you can't run for six months minimum. Well, I didn't have six months. So six weeks later, I was back training. I could take that pain and just put it in the back of my mind. I was out in California running a race. I came around a sharp turn, had to push off with my left foot, and it snapped on me again. And I went down like a shot. So there went the 84 chance of the Olympics. I finally, after two years of no running, started training again, ran the 88 Olympic marathon trials, did not have a good race, and I retired from that level of training. Still going to run, but now it was time to move on. I was only 31, 32 years old. That was considered old back then in the sport. Now you're just kind of hitting your prime. But running had given me more than I ever thought. And there's Salazar and I at the, he's getting up the podium there, getting his lower wreath. But after the Olympic trials in 88, I moved back to my Minnesota dairy farm. And my whole goal in life at that point was to milk a bunch of cows, do my fishing guide business, raise a bunch of kids, and life was going to be grand. And it absolutely was until November 13th of 1989. I got up that morning at about 3.30 like I always did. I walked out of my house, out to my dairy barn. I milked my 70 or so cows, got done doing a few other chores, and came out of the barn walking back towards the house to go inside and give my family a good morning hug and an I love you. Well, I got halfway between the barn and the house and I stopped dead in my tracks. I started thinking all of all the more important things I thought were more important that I had to get done that morning. I thought, gosh, Dick, you've got three wagon loads of corn to unload. The neighbor's coming over to help you finish combining and the weather service says there's a big snowstorm coming in a couple of days. You know what? Just tell your family you love them tonight at supper and give them a big hug then. And I turned around and walked the opposite direction. Big, big mistake. Anytime you have the opportunity to tell the people you love that you love them, you never, ever pass on that because you don't know if it'll be there later. Mine almost wasn't. So instead, I turned around and walked down a little hill. I jumped up on my tractor. I sat in the seat, started the tractor up, throttled her down. It was snorting like a freight train. I walked to the very back, and I pulled the lever that turns on a power takeoff. That's not the actual picture of the tractor at the time, but mine had a guard on it, but it doesn't matter. They're very, very dangerous. It started spinning, what, 600 revolutions a minute, something like that. And I turned to go back to the front of my tractor when all of a sudden, honestly, I thought somebody had come up from behind me, grabbed me by my shoulder blades and body slammed me into the ground. The next thing I realized, my left leg was being wrapped around that spinning shaft, like taking a piece of string and wrapping it around your finger. And when I couldn't take my leg anymore, it started taking my whole body and just whipping me around and around and it would bend me in two. And then I thought the tractor would die, and then all of a sudden it'd catch and it'd whip me around again. And every time it would slam my head into that frozen ground. And when I'd come back around, I threw out my left arm trying to grab that lever, but it was always about this far short. And the thought of dying wasn't the scary part, but the thought of not seeing my family again was unbearable. And then on this very cold, gray November morning, I could feel myself starting to lose consciousness, and I knew if that happened, it would be all over. It got so bright out, it was like looking up at the sun times a hundred. What felt like I was spinning around like a fast top, now I was in super slow motion. And all that noise, it was as quiet as the inside of a library. Was I having a near-death experience? That's all I can tell you that it must have been. And as I came around that one last time, I remember throwing out my left arm and it was like God had made it grown just enough to where I could get my fingers on the lever, but I couldn't get a grip. And when I close my eyes, I can still feel my hand slipping off. I heard three words. And in my faith and belief, it was from God. <clears throat> it was flick your wrist. To this day, 
I have no recollection how I got out of that tangled mess, but the next thing I remember is I'm standing upright next to my tractor, butt naked. I don't have any clothes on. I think one of my boots was still on. And I'm, of course, I'm in shock. I have no idea what happened. I'm just thinking, well, gosh dang it, Dick, you forgot to put your clothes on this morning. You better get to the house before the neighbor gets there. Well, I try to take a step and I face plant into the frozen ground. At that point, I knew something was definitely wrong because my left foot was sticking in my left ear. At that point, I could hardly breathe. I came to find out later I had all kinds of head contusions from getting my head slammed into the frozen ground. I'd broken all the ribs on my right side, punctured my right lung, broke my right arm, had a piece of loose steel that was laying on the ground driven into my chest, and my left leg was almost torn off. But I'm laying there on the ground. I knew I needed help. And that survival instinct on every one of us, hopefully you never have to use it, but it's there when you need it, believe me. And I knew my then wife Mary was either in the house or out in the barn. I knew my little boy Andy was off to kindergarten, but I knew I had to get help. So I could move my left arm, I could move my right leg. So I started grabbing anything I could on the ground with my left hand and arm pulling myself and pushing with my right leg and slithering like a snake, trying to get to the house. I got about a hundred feet away from any of their farm equipment when Mary found me laying in the dirt there. And I could tell by the look on her face, she goes, my God, Dick, what happened? I go, Mary, I, I got caught in a power takeoff. You gotta call 911. Well, of course we didn't have cell phones back then, but she sprints to the house, grabs a little portable phone. She's dialing their number. They're asking her all kinds of questions. Mary, we need to know, is Dick still caught in a power takeoff? Just a minute, she says, let me go check. Now remember, I'm 100 <laughs> feet away from the farm equipment. So she sprints over to me. She gets down next to me. She goes, Dick, Dick, they gotta know, are you still caught in the power takeoff? I started laughing. I go, Mary, does it look like I'm still caught in the power takeoff? Well, she backs off a little bit. She goes, sir, I'm looking at him right now, and he's all wrapped up in that thing. I'm thinking, holy cow, she needs the ambulance more than I do. Well, the sheriff finally gets there before the ambulance does, and I knew the sheriff, but he didn't know what to do. So he comes over and kneels next to me and starts telling me Ole and Lena jokes as I'm laying on the ground. I'm thinking, well, if I die, at least I'm going to die laughing anyhow. But I had incredible doctors, surgeons, nurses, physical therapists, neighbors, people I didn't even know, and a will and a desire to want to get better. Twice they thought they're going to have to amputate my left leg. I was in the hospital numerous times because of it, but I finally healed up and got back to the farm and even got back to eventually running again. And for the next two years, things were pretty much back to how I'd always hoped for. Until in July of 1992, I'm coming home from a little R&R &R from the cows. I'm 30 minutes from home when a person runs a stop sign on a country road and T-bones my car, totals out my car, busts my back, in the hospital, more surgeries, but I survived even eventually got into running, back to running a little bit again. Well, things were pretty much back to normal until that following winter when I was running down a street in Fargo, North Dakota. Oh yeah, sure, you betcha there. I was running down a street in Fargo, North Dakota and I got hit from behind by a truck. They found me laying in a snowbank. Back in the hospital, more surgeries, but I survived, even got back <laughs> to running again. Well, life was pretty much back to normal until that following spring when I'm hiking at Lake Bemidji State Park by where I live with my little boy Andy and a little buddy of his. Thankfully, they were about 20 meters behind me. I'm on this little narrow, almost like a deer trail up on what's called Rocky Point on the north end of Lake Bemidji. Now, this was before the trail system on the park was all developed and it had been raining for a few days and I'm walking along the edge of Rocky Point when I take a step and a chunk of ground breaks away and I fall off a cliff. 
I'm laying on the shore of Lake Bemidji on the rocks and I can't get up. I yell up, I go, Andy, stay away, <laughs> but get help. <laughs> well, somehow we made it to the ranger station, him and his little buddy. And about a half hour later, six voluntary firemen from the Bemidji Fire Department had worked their way down this steep embankment with a gurney board. Well, they get down to where I'm on the shore of Lake Bemidji laying on the rocks and they're a huffing and a puffing. I'm thinking, if they're a huffing and a puffing coming down this big embankment, <laughs> what's it gonna be like when they strap me on this board and take me back up? Well, they get me on the board, they strap me all down, they pick me up through in the side and they start marching up this big steep embankment. They get about halfway up, and one of the guys says, boys, if we don't take a little bit of a break, we're never going to make it to the top. So they gently set me down. Well, after a few minutes of catching their breath, the one guy says, all right, boys, let's pick them up and get them up into the ambulance. So again, they picked me up three on a side. But at this point, it was so steep, they just couldn't start hiking up there. They had to get a little momentum going. So it's like, a onesie and a twosie. Well, on the third one, they gave that gurney board a jerk. And when they did, the strap that was holding my chin down and my head slipped down and tightened up around my neck. I couldn't breathe. When you can't breathe, you can't say anything. Well, they finally get me to the top. And one of the guys looks down and he says, my God, he's foaming at the mouth and turning blue. So they drop me down. He takes a knife out and cuts off the strap. I get redness back in my cheeks again. Now, you'd think that would be the end of the story, wouldn't you? <laughs> Unfortunately, we still had about a quarter mile hike through the thick woods, so they strap me back down, pick me back up. They're blazing a trail through the thick woods to the ambulance out on the road. Halfway back, a pine tree branch breaks off into my right eye. They get me out to the ambulance and go, my God, he's got a Christmas tree sticking out of his eye. Well, they didn't want to just yank her out because they thought the eyeball might come out with it. So they duct taped it in there real good. So they pulled me into the emergency room at Bemidji Hospital and the docs didn't know if they should get the chainsaws out or what they should do. But I, sur I survived. I even once accidentally super glued my eyes shut, but I'm not even going into that one. But honestly, through it all, I've never questioned God or anybody else. Why is this happening to me? People would say to me, Beardsley, if you didn't have bad luck, you wouldn't have any luck at all. But honestly, I never ever looked at it like that. But you could take all those things I just mentioned, and fix, put them in a big bowl, swallow them down, and it pales to what happened a short time later. I became addicted to narcotics, opioids. They've been in the news a lot the last few years. I would not wish it on my worst enemy. I mean, growing up, I didn't smoke, never did any illicit drugs, never got into any trouble. What I'm telling you about this part of my life, and I know we're getting short on time here, I'll speed it up. When I speak at a recovery center somewhere around the country, that part of my life alone takes a good hour. But to give you a quick recap, by August of 1996, I was taking a cocktail of Valium, Percocet, and Demerol, all very highly addictive drugs, upwards of 80 pills a day. I was doctor shopping. Thank God that's impossible to do now because if you get a prescription filled in Brookings, South Dakota, or New York City, it pops up on a computer. And when I couldn't find any more doctors to give me any more, I started to forge my own prescriptions. I'd never been in any trouble in my life. I'd never stolen a piece of bubble gum. And here I'm doing something that I could have gone to prison for. Thankfully, on September 30th of 1996, I got caught. I knew I was in a lot of trouble, but I was so blessed and thankful that I was still alive and I knew the only chance I had if there was any chance at all to get better was to be 100% truthful and take responsibility for my life and that's what I did. I was given five years of probation 
460 hours of community service. They took me right to the hospital in Fargo and for the next 10 days I was in the psychiatric unit behind locked doors. That's where they put you back then, at least in Fargo. They put me on a drug called methadone. It's what they put heroin addicts on. That stuff is nasty. I became addicted to that in the hospital. They tried to wean me off it and the, the, the withdrawals were so intense, I can't even describe them for you. They then transferred me down to the University of Minnesota hospital there and I was in misery. The doctor came into my room, he says, Dick, methadone withdrawal is one of the worst things a human can go through. He says, you're gonna feel like you're gonna die. He says, there are gonna be days you're gonna wish you could die. But I promise you, Dick, we will not let you die. But the next seven days or so are gonna be, in his own words, pure hell. For the next seven days, I didn't sleep one minute. I would lay in my bed and the pain in my arms and my bones and legs was so intense from the withdrawals, I can honestly say if I would have had access to a saw, I would have really thought hard about sawing off my own arms and legs. In the morning when it was time to get up, it was a struggle for me just to get my legs on the outside of the bed. And to put on a clean pair of pants or a clean shirt, it seemed like it took me forever. But I never missed a meeting with my group to try to learn how to get better. And there were mornings I was so sick, I could not stand up and walk down the hallway to my group. I had to crawl on my hands and my knees. And one morning I'm crawling along the floor trying to get down to my group meeting and I blacked out. I have no idea how long I laid there, but when I woke up, I was laying in my own vomit. And I remember looking up and saying, God, please, God, either just take me right now or please, God, help get me better. And that night I actually slept just a little bit. And the next day a little bit more and a little bit more. And after I'd been there for about 30 days, I started to feel what it was like to be me, Dick Beardsley, without those drugs in my body. And I liked how it made me feel. Has it been easy? Absolutely not. But anything worth anything in your life just isn't handed to you on a silver platter. But the last 26 years I've had of sobriety from those drugs have been some of the best 26 years I've ever, ever had. You know, when I think back to that Boston Marathon, I think I just turned 25, maybe 26. And after I finally recovered from that race, I remember thinking, well, the good thing is I will never have to go through anything more difficult in my life. You know, I was young, that's what I thought. That's how much that race took out of me. But I was wrong. Then after that string of all those accidents and surgeries in a short period of time, once I finally got over all that and got recovered from that, I thought, well, I sure wouldn't wanna go through that again. But the good thing is I'll never have to go through anything more difficult. And again, I believed it, but again, I was wrong. And then after I had a few years of sobriety from the drugs, I remember thinking, boy, I would not wish that on my worst enemy. But the good thing is, I know for a fact, unequivocally, I would bet my life on it, that I never, ever have to go through anything more difficult in my life. But unfortunately, I was wrong. That's my Little boy Andy you heard me talking about. We adopted Andy from Honduras when he was just a little tot and uh, our pride and joy. He followed me around like a little puppy dog. If I shaved, he'd like to shave too, even though he didn't have a razor in his hand. He was my little fishing buddy. When he got out of high school, he joined the United States Army. I was never so proud of anybody in my life. My meager accomplishments I had in running paled compared to what he went through. And he always told me, Pop, it's such an honor to serve our country. He got deployed to Iraq, the war over there. He was a gunner in Black Hawk helicopters. 
Well, he made it home after a little over a year over there. Wasn't missing an arm, wasn't missing a leg. But he suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. <clears throat> and coming up on October 4th, just a couple of weeks away, it'll be the seventh anniversary when my son Andy, who was, here he is there, took his life. I was absolutely devastated. He's buried out next to his grandma and grandpa out in Bolensteel, South Dakota. I go out there every spring, every fall. I miss him dearly. But the last thing I know my son Andy would want me to do would be wallow in my self-pity. That would be the last thing. And what brings me peace and joy is knowing that someday, again, I will be able to hold him in my arms, <clears throat> sorry, and give him a big hug. And Pop, or he always told me, Pop, don't you ever, ever give up. And I told him that many times on his way over to Iraq. Don't you ever, ever give up. There's always that hope, that hope we can believe in. They say you can live 40 days without food, seven days without water, a few minutes without breathing, but you can't live one second without hope. And hope for me, it's brought me happiness, it's brought me opportunities. Hope brings me peace. Hope brings me everything. And like I've always tried to tell myself and pass it on to others, no matter how bad of a day you're having today, know that, to <clears throat> know that tomorrow that sun is going to rise again. And it's a new beginning. It's a new day. And you can always hope that tomorrow's going to be better than it was today. And if it's not, that sun will come up again the next day. And maybe that's the day it'll be better. And in closing, I want to just say thank you very much for letting me be here. Sorry I went way over my time. But these are four things I try to do every single morning when I wake up. And it's helped me through a lot of tough situations in my life. And it might just help you too. And every morning when I wake up, I try to wake up with a smile on my face enthusiasm in my voice, joy in my heart, and faith in my soul. Those four things have gotten me through a lot in my life. They might just help you also. Quickly, do, is, do any of you have any questions? Don't be bashful because I, I'm an open book. You can ask me anything. You know, it's been what, maybe 40 years since I've seen that tape of that race, and I still, you know, it still <laughs> brings that adrenaline rush to watch it in the end. And, and, you know, if it had just been like an additional <laughs> 10 yards, you know, like that, 10 more yards of race. Listen, I've seen that, that video literally thousands of times, and it still makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And every time I watch it, I keep thinking, maybe this time I'm going to beat him, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it hasn't happened yet, but, um, yeah, I know it. Yes? I just thought that maybe you got bumped by the or motorcycle, maybe took you off your... Your stride, is that any truth to that? You know, I've never used that as an excuse, ever. I mean, the next morning in the Boston Globe, there were a bunch of articles, a lot about that little incident there at the end. One of the reporters said I had motorcycle tracks on my back. So, I mean, that was a little uh, exaggerated. You know, I, as you saw maybe in the video, I had to go out a little wide to get around it. But, I, you know, I caught back up to him. And the, I think the mistake I made when I look back is I remember when I got her on the motorbike and I thought, okay, when you catch back up to him, because I knew I was going to catch back up to him. When you catch back up to him, because I'd worked hard to get up to him, sit back for just a split second, catch your breath, and then go. And that was the mistake I made because when I got back up to his side, I sat back for a split second and bam, he started his kick. And by the time I responded, I just... Ran out of room at the end, but um, you know, it's it's one of those races that I'll never forget and I'll tell you I'll be honest with you. I don't think there's any individual athlete or team that has gotten more bang for their buck finishing second than I have Honest the guy. It's pretty crazy Anybody else? Well tonight. Oh Kevin. Yeah, so my first encounter with, with Dick was at a road race in Olivia, Minnesota and it was Olivia, the corn capital of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. If you've been to the cities on 212, you, you know, you've driven right through it. 
there was two celebrities there that weekend. Olivia Newton-John, she was the parade marshal, <laughs> and the second celebrity they didn't know about, it was Dick. So we were running this 20-mile race, we <laughs> finished together, but I thought, I think back on that now. I do too. That was fun. And I think I got there, did well, I get there a little late? late? Because we had started, we, we were probably five or six miles into it, Pete Casper, short little blocky kid. Yeah. He ran here in South Dakota State too. And he said, um, there's supposed to be some hot shot coming from Rush City, Minnesota. <laughs> maybe, maybe he just didn't make it to the race. And somebody said, well, maybe he'll show up. And sure enough. A couple miles later, here comes Dick. Well, I started late, so I thought, well, I'll see if I can catch the guy. <laughs> Luckily, I was able to, to catch him. So um, so tonight, too, over at the Art Museum, is that what it's called? At 7 o'clock. I think it's open to the public, isn't it, Bob? Yeah, it's it's free. And, you know, tomorrow's the 60th running of the Jack Rabbit 15, and I ran it 42 years ago. And so I'll be kind of reliving that a little bit and talking about the, that race was a huge turning point for me in my running career that jack 15. Um, i'm not going to talk about it now but i will a little bit tonight at the uh at the reception they're having over at the art thing uh art museum at seven o'clock tonight it'll be a lot of fun is anybody running the jack 15 tomorrow you are you run the whole thing or on a team all right i'll be out there too i'm gonna if I, I ran an hour and 14 minutes and some change 42 years ago, if I can, if I can double that time, like so about two and a half hours, I would be tickled pink. But I don't know if I can run that fast, to be honest with you. But it'll be fun to, to reminisce and get back out there again. So thank you all for coming. And uh, great seeing you. Bob, Kevin, good to see you guys. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.